started, but um, if people come in, it'll be okay, and we'll just kind of move through stuff, but please take your time. I'm Susanna Johnson, and my company, my organization is my own, which is Individualized Realized, um, developed and implemented 100% individualized curriculum in the classroom uh, while working at Assets for uh, a long time. So left the classroom in 2019 to start helping other people step into more student-centered learning practices. And along the way, I made a bunch of partnerships, including with What School Could Be. So today I'm here as the What School Could Be partner. I'm the Director of Curriculum and Coaching for Global um, Conversations. So fun stuff that happened. Um, that's, I'll just keep the introduction very simple and at that because it's really not about me. When you come to a session about caring and connected communities, it's about you and it's about our community. So I want to jump right into that. But logistically, um, understanding that things are kind of slower today, and that's okay. We may have people trickling in, that's okay. Um, in terms of your own comfort and what's happening, we're here until 12. I want you to feel free to get up and move around as you need to, go get to the bathroom, go get a drink of water if you need to, whatever needs to happen. You want to be working on your lesson plans for Monday, that's really fine with me. You can do cartwheels in the back and it's fine. It's the beauty of a life at assets. You get used to just anything happening in the classroom and, and what's going on. So. Um, thanks so much for coming today, though, and this is a very important topic. Um, when it comes to caring and connected communities, it's one of the five key aspects that What School Could Be talks about, and I'll get into that in a second, and, and how we really shape things. But for me, this is not where I live and breathe. Caring and connected is a little bit outside of my comfort zone. I'm a logic person. I'm a thinking person. I get out of bed every day to do this work because I want to live in a world of better thinkers, and it's very important to me that we in education actually are cultivating that, that we're creating it, that we're doing something that helps us to actually have a better future of humanity, right? <laughs> and um, so the thinking part of it is always where I, I come from, but the connected and caring space is how we get there. And I've been working more and more on this as I've gotten through some long conversations globally on the purpose of school and why do we do this thing called education what humanity is really trying to do, and how do we do better humaning practices. All of that is really important to me, and so now I'm starting to lean in a little bit more into the caring aspect of things and a little bit of the emotions. I'm going to try not to trip on things. I have to use a microphone um, so that we're here. This QR code here is for the slides. They're also dropped into the session description if you want to have copies of it. There are links to things in there um, that we'll be using today, but you've got that, and um, everything I have is open source, so you're welcome to use it. This is the What School Could Be community. If you want to jump in there and join that, you can if you haven't already. Um, but you can also go to community.whatschoolcouldbe.org and go directly there. You can go to whatschoolcouldbe.org and there's a link to join the community. The What School Could Be community space is actually a free and open space that has been um, supported by the Dinter Smith Foundation. We'll talk about Ted in a minute. But um, the space is actually for people who are interested in education. There is not any advertising, so you won't get people calling you and bothering you about insurance or seeing any of that. We also don't have people in the community who are not actually invested. So there's actual human monitoring of the space in the community. We're at, I think, 15,000 people globally right now, which is amazing. It's only been around for a few years. And it's great to be able to connect with other educators. And we'll talk about what's in the space in a second. And again, if you need those, again, we can come back around to it. We've got the slides. Okay, let's connect a little bit ourselves this morning. So if I can get everybody to stand up and come join me up here in the front, let's make a little circle. Y'all been sitting through a keynote, you can stand for a couple of seconds. <laughs> Plus movement, right? We're educators, we move. <laughs> and I think we've heard her name in almost every session, well, every session I've been in the past two days, but um, Auntie Pua, Pua, Pua Burgess is the, the guru of all things loving and wonderful in our Hawaiian education community space, so this is taken from parts of, of what she's done over the years, but um, we'll just do a quick aloha circle just to kind of say good morning and introduce ourselves to everything. So um, your name, as you want us to use it, and how you want us to pronounce your name as we have conversations today. The question, what's your weather, you can answer in any way, shape, or form that feels right to you. Some people use it about the mood, some people think about what's actually happening with the weather and, and how that's going, but um, up to you and uh, how that is. And then somebody that you're holding with you today. We can't talk about being a connected community without holding our community in some space. And so, um, so I'll start us off and then we can just go around and we don't have to use the microphone for this piece of it. <laughs> I'm Susanna and um, my weather today I would say is like hazy, um, and, but in a good way. I'm kind of in this, you know, when you're in the haze and you can 
you're just ready for maybe something to expose itself, like a mountain or the sun or the sky to open up. I'm ready for that, but I'm feeling that just like kind of calmness that hay sort of brings, um, which is great. And I'm holding with me today, I just got a video from my great nephew, um, who is uh, two and a half, and a little good morning anti-sunshine from him. So uh, that, I'm holding him with me because everything I do is thinking about how do we make sure that the world he lives in as he grows is a good place and not as horrible and, and harsh as it is today, right? So I'm holding Bash with me this morning. Okay, let's go this way. Um, I'm Shannon. Um, I, I guess my weather would be a sunrise today. Um, and then who I'm holding with me would be my mom. So she's just far away. So. Hi, I'm Bethany. Um, my weather is, hmm, my weather is uncertain. It's Texas weather. It comes in, like, comes out sunny, and then it'll go cloudy, and then it'll go rainy, and I'll be back to sunny within five seconds. <laughs> so I'm really not sure. And who am I holding with me today? Actually, I'm missing my classroom. I haven't seen them in two days. I'm missing my kids. They drive me crazy on the mornings, but I miss them right here. So, that's good. good. Hi, I'm Andrew Johnson, and um, my weather is sunny. It's Friday, so it's super um, sunny. And I'm holding with me today my baby grandson who took his first steps today. My son oh. sent me a video. Christina, my weather is calm, and I'm holding my kids with me today. Um, I'm Angela, my weather is partly cloudy, and I'm holding my brother with me today. Good morning everyone, I'm Sister Belen Polichia OP. Uh, my weather today is good, and I'm holding with my, our sisters in the community where we pray every day. Hey, young sister is Belanza Espino. My weather today is uh, quite, you know, quite calm. Yeah. And I'm coming today is my incoming ultrasound. Hi, uh, Marty. Um, weather is sunny because it's almost the weekend, so I'm looking forward to that. And then uh, my kids. Hi, I'm Danielle. Um, my weather is also partly cloudy just because I um, went on a hike with the sixth graders yesterday and so my body is like dying. I'm not happy about that. <laughs> but I'm holding with me today. I, I just love this conference and so many people um, that I get to see through all the different Dana. Uh, my weather is partly sunny, um, and I'm holding my son today who needs, I have three, but my son needs a little extra love. So. You want to join in our Aloha circle? Oh, yeah. You're welcome to it. <laughs> I feel like you could probably get jump into what's happening uh, right away if you're ready for it. Fire. <laughs> Just your name, what's your weather, and who are you holding with you today as we jump into the what conversation? Yeah, like your personal weather or the weather outside or whatever the weather is to you. Uh, my name is uh, Davide uh -huh. and uh, my weather is uh, sunny most of the time. Uh -huh. uh, what am I holding with you today? Uh, I'm not holding anything. <laughs> <laughs> it was about who, it's a, it's a who are you bringing with you, like who are you thinking about that you might bring into a conversation about the community? Uh, like a who, a person. A person? Mm -hmm. uh, my wife. Okay. Yeah, good. Well, thanks everybody for sharing that. It's nice to connect a little bit and just to get this, like, where are we, right? Like, are we we in the, the space and, and mindset to be ready to go? So, so thanks, have a seat um, and relax a little bit. Um, I'm going to get you through, this is our, our rough agenda for the day, and it seems ambitious, but it's actually not that much, it goes pretty quickly. Um, but we're, we're already setting our intentions a little bit. We set our intentions as we came into the space by stepping into it, and I'm very grateful that you're willing to do that and be vulnerable this morning. Um, we will do some connection through what school could be, and I'm going to actually include some information about that just to kind of share that resource and as a space for you to connect with other educators globally, which is great. And then, of course, um, some reasons why we're doing this. 
I think that if you've even been paying attention, even if you have only been here today, the conversation is absolutely about how are we doing as humans and how are we taking care of each other. So I don't have to create that sense of urgency, but I want to give a little context into you know, how we frame it and then put it together. We'll talk about our own classroom structures, our own mindsets, our own communities, and how we're trying to build them. And then we're going to actually get into exploring some resources and moving into action so that you walk out the door with a little bit of a plan for how you might do some things. Um, so I'm going to start here. Um, and this is not a small question for me. Every classroom, every time I'm in, in front of a room, I ask this question. And I always think about it in general. Where am I actually at? So, what are you thinking about today? Um, if you can see some of these pictures here, this has just been my recent um, months on the road and working with different folks all over the world. Um, but what I'm definitely thinking about, the top two pictures are pictures from when I was in Spain. And I'm thinking about how inspired I was being in those, did a different community, a place that I was not familiar with. And especially there was a lot of art that was amazing to me. And the picture on the top right there is um, at a flamenco show that I was at. And, having something that moves just your whole soul because it's such a powerful kind of music. So, um, so I'm thinking about like how am I holding that inspiration? That's on my mind a lot today. I had the occasion, um, bottom left-hand corner there, recently at the um, Deeper Learning Remix Conference in uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota at the High School for Recording Arts. And it's uh, an incredible school. They have maybe the most challenged community collectively that I've ever seen. They're, it's a charter school and their population at any time between 35 and 50 percent of the kids don't have a home. So that's a tremendous hardship that we don't even, I mean we have a lot of hardship in why, but that's a, a thing that we can't know. But these kids are actually not just going to school and feeling supported, but they're actually doing important work. The recording arts still happens there, they still do proper music. So um, the kickoff party was actually at Prince's house uh, and some of the people who originally worked with Prince and produced his music were there singing and doing some things. In the middle there, that's a team I was working with in Poland um, recently, and but the team is actually from Lithuania. And they were so excited because they just had finalized working on this project and this thing that they're going to do to connect their students with what was happening because they have a lot of the Ukraine overflow, and so they've been dealing with all of that. And so like, how do we move forward with learning um, in a way that actually connects us to, to where we're at? But that team is very fun and very inspiring because we talked about it, they built something, and by that night, I ran into them in the hotel lobby and they were like, we just set it up and everything's done and we're starting on Monday. So it was really, it's fun to me to see that change can happen in, in a moment and instant. Um, and then this is the most powerful book I've read this year and I'm, I'm still thinking about it. If you haven't heard of it, I highly encourage it, but Punish for Dreaming helps us to really think about systemic oppression and racism in our country, especially in the world of education. And um, she tells an amazing story, so I really uh, encourage that to, to get there. So pause for a second and just think for yourself. If you're the kind of person who's a notebook person, just like write it down. Um, I definitely do. But what are you thinking about today? Just take a couple of seconds to think about that. And I do actually pause for reflection. So 30 seconds, think about what you're thinking about. What's on your mind? <laughs> thinking first, then we'll talk. We're there. <laughs> and write it down again if you're a notebook person or you just... Put it in your notes, your phone. There's a reason I asked this question, um, and I mentioned before I come from a place of logic and thinking, but for me, asking this question with students makes sure to allow some space for when things are coming up that are not related to what's happening, um, right? And so what are you thinking about today? You know, you're here, it's first period, and you're supposed to be thinking about geometry. But what if your dog died last night? What if on the way to school there was an accident and you saw something horrific? What if your girlfriend, boyfriend broke up with you in like morning over text, right? Like, there are lots of things that could be on our minds that are making it hard for us to show up as we need to to be ready to learn. Um, and we'll talk about this a little bit more in detail, but I, the neuroscience, I'm a big neuroscience geek, and the neuroscience tells us that we have 35 years of research on this now, and global research, right? Thousands and thousands of kids in 150 countries from the OECD. And the number one predictor of success 
in terms of learning in all capacities, whether it's long-term, short-term, testing, money, jobs, all of that stuff, number one predictor of success is relationships and how we feel when we're learning, right? So it's important for us to be thinking about this. Hold with you that thing that you're thinking about or the things that you're thinking about. But then I'm going to add this question in and make sure that we actually take some time and pause on this. Because for me, that question changes the game entirely. And it's starting to ask that of kids or of ourselves, of our coworkers, when we walk into the buildings and into our work each day, are you okay? Sometimes we just need somebody to ask that before we realize, you know what, I'm not. I need some more. I need some help. I need some love. I need some support. I'm not okay. Or yeah, I'm okay. Are you okay? It's that reciprocal relationship that kind of comes up. But asking that question, are you okay, of kids, changed my relationship with students forever and changed the way that I approach the classroom. Because no matter what, if somebody says, no, I'm not okay, they're going to need something besides geometry that morning. They're going to need something else. They need some time and space. They need to go talk to somebody, whatever it is. But are you okay is a really important question for us to be thinking about. I'm okay in general this morning, but in, in the, the grand scheme of things, I'm not okay because the world is really not okay, right? So I want us to take a few minutes on these questions and start to have some conversations. I would like for you to have a conversation with no more than three people. So find either a cluster of two or three. If you feel like you want to branch out and talk to somebody that you've never met before, that's a good decision. Try that a little bit. And just a quick reminder that as we do these things and get into it, um, try to have that space of some trust and vulnerability and recognize that we're not here to judge, we're not here to gossip, we're not here to cause trouble, we're here to just be there as humans for each other. So I'm, I'm gonna actually pause this for a little bit of time to actually have these conversations. So get into it and take your time answering these questions with each other. What are you thinking about? And are you okay? You can decide which one you start with. Okay, we good? Your market set, go. Yeah. Branch out. Can I, can, can I be that weird one? Can I please fix that? It's upside down. And I'll branch I out. Cannot. Can I join you? Yeah, it's not mine. So, sure. I want to do whatever you want. They can have to yeah. yeah. It's just because of that's where it was. And so it's. I'm sorry. I'm just like. I'm actually just going to say, because I thought she'd be able to be upside down. I was like, I'm watching you. And I'm like, I can't. Do your thing. This is oh, my first conference, you? so um, oh, okay. yeah. pretty happy to be here. Uh, I'm at Asia Pacific International. Yeah. I used to teach public uh, school, but now I wanted my son to end his term of public school. I school. guess so. Where is that? It's in Hawaii.
And it's also like my first experience, so I was super humble about it. Just in her own house, and she was like, like, well, like, I'm a student. Like, it's, I'm, a, I'm a baby. I was always happy, you know. And I just missed it. And I did that exact same thing. Juliana, I think she is like a small private school in Kona. Hey, I'm not crazy. You guys see that? So, yeah, these are small parts that are great. Oh, nice. You know, make connections yeah. and, like, and see that the world is really small. I could visit there. Like, I feel like this is the second time. Like, <laughs> like, and, uh, well, Mike's grandson and Alex taking inspirational stuff. So it's kind of holidays. I know, it's completely different. Yeah, it's like, you're just like, 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 like,
conversations as it feels right to you. Ignore me for the next few minutes. I'm going to go through some quickly through some like the basic info and stuff. But I hope that this, like, whenever whenever we have conversations, whenever I'm in front of a group, I'm always thinking about is this something that could actually change, you know, pedagogy. And I remember the first time I learned. I remember directly, like, exactly the person, exactly the moment in the conference when I heard somebody ask that question, like. That's something that he did in his classroom every single day, and how that changed the conversation. And so then I started doing it, right? So along the way today, I, all, I, I like to try to just point to those like instructional moves. If you do nothing else, maybe next week, just check in, ask everybody, are you okay? And see how they're doing, right? It's a really tough time in the world. The holidays are coming up, it's a lot of things. And so what's it like um, to be there? I'm gonna give you the background on the What School Could Be stuff just because I think it's really helpful and important and because this helps to set the stage for why caring and connected communities matter. Um, in the middle there you see it's Ted Dinter Smith and that's the reason for this organization. He helped to produce the movie Most Likely to Succeed which came out in 2015 and that is the most watched education movie of all time globally which is crazy. Um, he had the opportunity to uh, sell it to Netflix when it was first coming out and decided not to, took it on the road, went to all 50 states, and did public screenings and had conversations with whole communities. So when we talk about a caring and connected community, the impetus for what school could be actually came out of him going to all the communities all over the country and seeing what was happening. And then he wrote the book, What School Could Be, and that helped to shape some things. And then um, got into some conversations with, um, I'm sure everybody recognizes Sir Ken Robinson on the right, if you're not familiar with him. Most watched TED Talk of all time and still extremely relevant, even though it was, um, came out in 2004. It's Do Schools Kill Creativity, but he is um, no longer with us, but one of the most important global educators of this century, for sure, and then Tony Wagner. But the three of these gentlemen got together and said, we should have a space for teachers to connect. Because all the best things that are happening in the world, all the best things that are happening in education, all the best ideas are already happening in the classroom right now. And they decided that connecting educators with each other was more important than any other conference, any other professional development, anything that you could pay for a class. It's let's just connect teachers to teachers. So started the What School Could Be community, um, actually opened the doors for it in March of 2021. Um, sorry, I'm just getting my timeline right of like when things happen. I made that space and I was there that day. I was the person actually letting everybody into the community, sat there for about 700 clicks. <laughs> <laughs> letting people in and watching it happen and seeing that first day and then seeing where we are now with people all over the world. Um, the space itself is pretty fun. We have a lot of great uh, resources that exist there. We have our innovation playlist, which is a series of videos, and we're going to get into that and use some of that today so that you can just kind of get used to those resources. Bless you. We also have um, events all the time, so there are conversations. We host books, um, book studies with the authors, and so some of the best education authors. We record all that stuff so you can go in now and see conversations with some of the best people in education and read a book alongside it and, and see. Um, and then just um, regular conversations with teachers. Uh, Josh Rapoon, who is the What School Could Be podcast globally now, and he's a longtime Hawaii educator. Um, he hosts a podcast discussion group, uh, I think it's once a month, maybe twice a month. They just get together and hang out and talk about whatever. Um, thing is on there, and it's a pretty fun little conversation. So just fun things and great ways to connect with teachers all over. Um, we have what we believe is a powerful change model, and this is what the thinking is and what's around it. We definitely are interested in mobilizing communities and making sure that what happens in a community makes sense for that space. The work that I do when I'm in Madrid, Spain, is entirely different than the work that I do when I'm in rural Minnesota. Right? The communities have different needs. They have different stuff. That Even in Minnesota, just being in Minneapolis proper with the school, the high school for reporting arts versus Bold, which is a small school that collects a couple of tiny towns and has a total of 100 kids, the entire school. They have different needs in those communities, right? So we believe very much so in getting the connection and the space from the community. Invited and celebrating, um, we aren't interested in telling anybody how to do things. We're going to give you some thoughts and ideas, but you know what you want to do and how to build it for yourself. Of course, small steps for big change and that we have also a bias for action. So that's why I said today before we walk out, we're going to actually have some things that we are doing. We have our um, peak principles. This is our, our powerful learning and how we get into this conversation around it. Purpose is at the center, which is great. That's my number one value in life. And so I feel really good about that being part of the work that I do. But that students actually feel a sense of purpose is our main goal. And that's important. What is your
your purpose for being here today? What's your, what's your reason for coming to Schools of the Future? I know for me it is, I heard Danielle say the same thing, a lot to kind of see people and connect with all the other educators of Hawaii, hopefully to be inspired and learn a little bit. But maybe you're here because somebody said you had to be. Maybe that's it. Maybe you're looking for the one thing that will help you to move forward or feel like you can make some changes that will be important for education. Who knows? Think about your own purpose, but we also have to make sure that that purpose is clear for our students on a regular basis. Um, essential skills and mindsets foster competencies that are essential to life, right? So we all know those things. We know we need the five C's, four C's, seven C's, however many you want to count at this point. But how are we doing that? And what we try to do with what school could be is provide actual implementing steps, options, ways for you to think about something and then move into some action so that you can actually do it. Agency is my favorite thing. Um, as I mentioned before, my work is all about student-centered learning and individualized processes. So making sure that students actually have an opportunity to have not just a voice in their learning journeys, but that they are actually the ones that are curating their, their journey, that they're, they're making it happen for themselves, that they can actually have some ownership of their learning. Because that's when the power happens, that's when change comes, and that's also how we get ready for life. It's not about us telling them how to get through their day, it's about them telling us what they need to know in order to get out into the world and be, feel like they can have confidence and function forward. And then of course, deep retained knowledge. Um, one of the things that I've, I've heard much over the past several years of being all over the, the world talking about education is that when we talk about innovation in education, people get really scared that we're going to lose content. They're really scared that we're going to lose the meat of what we do. The kids aren't going to actually be learning their letters and reading and phon phon um, phonetic awareness stuff. They're not going to be understanding basic computation. But innovation in education is not about that, and especially through the stuff that we do at What School Could Be and also my work. It's really about how do we connect more deeply to those standards? How do we make sure that we are honoring what we need to know for content and information, but in a way that makes sense for students and that genuinely helps us to be excited about learning, right? So, it's important to keep that knowledge space in mind. Um, our process is pretty simple and straightforward. If you go into the community, and we'll get there in a second and see it, but first it starts with mobilizing your community. How do we have those conversations that help us to really move things forward? What does our community need? What does our school need? What do our kids need in order to move into a future that we can't possibly know or predict? And then we get into what we call our student-centered learning practices, and that piece of it is really strong. How do we make sure that we're actually listening to their voices and hearing what they need for their journeys and that they feel that empowerment, that agency piece? We also talk about evidence of deeper learning. What does that look like when we start to change things? How can we measure learning in a way that is not just tests, papers, productive productions or exhibitions? What are different options that we could use to make sure that we're capturing some evidence of learning that makes sense there? We also talk about real-world connections, real-world challenges, so that there is this thing that connects us to what's happening in the rest of the world. It's not just about geometry for geometry's sake. It's geometry to understand nature. It's geometry to understand architecture. It's geometry to build things. It's definitely more important to be thinking about those connections. How do we make sure that we have those? And then our final piece of the puzzle is our caring and connected community space, which is what we're going to be talking more about today. I left, I put this in here just so that you could be reminded why you came to this session and to help hold me accountable through this process. But it's the big thing. I would never do this or make you read it, and I'm not going to read the whole thing. But just try to take a look at this and think about any of the words in there that made you decide to choose to come and have this conversation today, right? Diverse makes sense to me in a lot of ways, and it's definitely on my mind as we think about it. We try to pretend like we don't have issues of diversity or um, problems of racism in Hawaii, but we do. And so I'm thinking about that a lot, especially hearing some of the conversations, those of you who were fortunate to have the keynote yesterday and the poetry and the understanding of language, Hawaiian language, and the oppression around all the different language components. We don't set things up for people who don't speak English. We don't set it up for our learners who are coming from other places, and yet we are the quintessential melting pot, right? So we've got to do a better job of that. I'm also thinking a lot about that reflection piece. I added that in this morning as a, not that we're here, but just in our conversation. How much time do we actually give to kids to reflect on what they're doing and what they're learning? 
I think for a lot of teachers, even if you ask them, like the are you okay question, or what are you thinking about, and then like have them just thinking, to have a silent room for two, three minutes, five minutes is really hard and really uncomfortable for teachers. But I swear, if you make a tiny bit of space for reflection, the students are going to be able to have that space to think, to slow down, to breathe, and to make sure that they're connecting to the others that they're learning. So, everybody picked a word or two that they're thinking about, that they're holding as, as a reason for this? And what does it mean to have a caring and connected community? Um, I'm going to play this short video because it helps us to set this sense of urgency piece. So, hold on. Get in here. Hopefully it all works out okay.
the poor person who's working that section just standing there not being human anymore, right? It really is changing the way that we think about things. And as they pointed out in you know, early 1900s, change is slow, now change is fast. What we have in terms of technology now, just even from last year, it's incredible. And the rate of change in chip technology is 10 to the 10th power, which means that what's happening right now in this very second, just as I'm talking about this, exponentially changed because of how fast we're growing. What does that mean? There are tons of conversations about AI. We don't need to get into it deeply today, but I just want to point out to you from my perspective, I think it's a good thing that we can maybe outsource some of the little small parts of our job in order to make space for our connection to students. Um, Melissa Handy had a great session yesterday talking about this conversation and how to leverage AI. And what she was saying was, you know, this gives you some tasks, it gives you things to do, it gives you an opportunity for students to be doing things on their own so that you can connect more with other students. And just knowing that as a computer science and robotics teacher, that's how she's thinking about it, made my heart sing. Because I think about the fact that if we could actually free up even five to 10% of our time each week, how much more powerful our human connections could be. How much more human potential we could reach in terms of our creativity, our imagination, art, music, fun, right? This is important, and this is how we do a good job of humaning. But I just want to keep us there. Um, but we're in the business of human development, and I've been saying this for a few years, but now I'm making sure it's a part of every conversation. It is a business, education, let's be clear about that. <laughs> but it is human development. And so our goal for the last, uh, the next hour, a little bit less than that, um, is to actually think about how we could do a better job of human development pieces using some of the tools that we can have here. Okay? That's the business that we're in. All right, um, I threw up some norms, and you can take them or leave them in, in terms of what you, uh, how you like to interact, but as we dig into this work over the next, call it 50 minutes at this point, I hope that we can adhere to some of this stuff. You can set your own norms in the classroom. You already have them. Um, personally, I think it's important to have the norms set by everybody who's in the room. So let's take a look at this list and let's just sort of like give a, like we agree to this and you don't have to agree to all of them, but at least agree to a couple of them for yourself. So we'll just do that with a like I agree to it or a show of hands or an affirmative, whatever feels right to you. But um, sharing the well, which means that everybody's conversation, everybody's contribution is important and that we are making space for everybody. Anybody? I agree to that. Okay. All right. Start from questions. We've already been asking ourselves some questions today. Um, up to you if you want to, yeah, can we start from questions maybe? Speak from the I perspective or the we. I want to make sure that you encourage, I encourage you to bring along your community, your school, your um, coworkers, your family, whatever is important to you, your wife. <laughs> um, fail up and forward. We as teachers don't like that word, fail. But I used to teach failure-based learning because I think it's a really important concept for all of us to get used to, but that we use it as an opportunity to go up and forward. So, there, yeah, feeling good about that one? How do we feel about being present? I'm not gonna lie, when I'm in a conference and I'm sitting in the room, I'm like maybe 60% present, maybe 40% thinking about other stuff. It's okay, I honor that, it's fine, but can we be mostly present, at least when we're talking to other humans, okay. Um, everybody, anybody willing to lean into the discomfort? I'm super comfortable with uncomfortable, but the rest of the world is less comfortable with uncomfortable. So, okay, some, some like, that was a little more trepidatious nodding, but okay. Um, this one is a fun one. I don't, this is, this is a slide I took from a, a friend, um, but say, ouch to signal injury, and I thought that's such a cute thing to do when you're having a professional learning um, conversation. Somebody says something that doesn't feel right, just say, ouch, instead of, you suck, you're a terrible person. <laughs> Ouch, that kind of hurts a little bit. Can we maybe reframe that? Maybe a better way? Okay. Um, respecting confidentiality. I hope that as we dig into this work this next few minutes that we actually get into some stuff that is important and relevant for you and your community. Maybe even personally. Let's respect that confidentiality piece. You're not going to be on the video in terms of your private conversations. This is what's on the video. This is the big voice. Um, so just respect that as we leave today. Don't share in anything that anybody, oh, over it, you know, who knows how they're working on this thing and they're going to be trying to do this because they have this problem. It's not our chance to gossip. This is our chance to actually just support each other in this process and being open to growth. Can we all agree to being open to growth? Yeah, okay, good. These are our norms. 
you have those in your classroom, but it is an actual move, a, a very important instructional move to make those norms known, but also make sure that you actually do them with your students. I would encourage that no matter what, if you haven't already done it. Um, this I also really like as a good visual to understand of where we are. Our comfort zone is where we feel safe and we can reflect. That's our private time, that's our prep time, that's our classroom, that's our conversations with our very trusted colleagues and friends that we can go to and say, this happened, I don't know what to do or how to handle it. Learning zone is where you're kind of coming out of it and starting to grow a little bit. Um, but then there's also this outer circle, this panic zone, where something is beyond what you're familiar with and becomes very difficult. The concepts of small steps for change resonate when it comes to this, but I also want to just keep that in mind as you're thinking about this, that you may be ready to push it to a much more culturally responsive classroom or a place that is more of a safe zone for all students, but your organization might need a little bit more time for that, and that conversation might cause panic for others. So I just kind of want to recognize where we're at with this, and if at any point you're feeling you're in your panic zone, back off, take a break, take a walk, come back, like, back down to earth a little bit, it's okay. Make sure that you don't um, stay in that panic zone. Okay. This is from the National Association for Independent Schools, and these questions here, we're gonna sit here for a second, and I would like for you to take some time to think about how do we set up a classroom that actually feels good to everyone in the room? How do we create that space? It's November, your classrooms are created. You have a culture already. What is that culture now? Is it a culture where there is demonstrable respect for others? differences or similarities aside. The safest container for brave and authentic truth-telling for others and myself is a fun question. I don't think most of us even feel that in our personal lives, let alone in our classrooms. And yet, we are the safe space for our learners and for each other. Stepping forward and back, when should I step forward and step back to be my best self or create space for others to do the same? The values question, we don't ask enough either. We have our own values and we assume that those values are universal and they're not. Everybody has different sets of values that come to the table. When was the last time you took some time out of your very important classroom work to talk about what's important to you? What do you care about? What do you value? Have you ever done values exercises? There are a million different opportunities Type it into ChatGPT right now and find. <laughs> Please give me three different examples of value. <laughs> Lessons, uh, questions, conversations, exercises, right? Um, the leadership when conflict arises within me or in the group is a big question. That's something as teachers we feel like we have to fix all the situations or prevent them. But it's not really about that. Conflict's going to happen in life. It's normal to disagree. It's normal for not everybody to have exactly the same thoughts about everything. So what's gonna, what are we going to do about it when conflict arises? Is it up to us as teachers to fix it, solve it, protect? Or is it up to us as teachers to lead how to resolve conflict in a way that includes everybody's voice and perspective in that conversation? This is a big one. So I'm just going to just kind of sit here for a second. Think for a second about a conflict that you've had in your school or classroom environment. Can be recent, can be long time. I taught um, a lot of things over the years, but one of the things I taught regularly was philosophy. And when you get into philosophy, you're inevitably into conversations about religion because it's all overlapping, it's thinking, it's humanity, it's like how we do things. Um, and so pretty quickly, anytime you get into philosophical conversations or anything related to religion, students are going to argue about it because they come from their own perspective and their own life, right? And so I remember early on in teaching and, and feeling like I had to make sure that kids didn't fight with each other about this stuff. And then somewhere along the way, as I started to open up my own learning, my own expanding my how to do things in the classroom and letting students have that ownership of the space and the voice, I thought, maybe it's not about preventing the conflict, it's about how do we talk about things in a productive way when we don't always agree? How do we learn to listen? I 
rely heavily on deep critical thinking practices and not just the hopeful, oh, I hope they're getting critical thinking. I did explicit instruction of critical thinking. And as I moved into that, it made it so important um, to be able to get students to say, like, what are some key questions here? What is the concept? How do we really think about different assumptions that are coming into that conversation? What are other perspectives? What are the implications if I stand my ground and I fight with this person about my own religious beliefs or my own background, right? And letting them get into that space where they could actually have those conversations with each other, to me, that was better leadership for my classroom and for what was happening, right? Everybody thought of a conflict and you've got one? Has anybody ever had something blow up? A big fight, a big situation? Something that couldn't be resolved? I'm seeing some eyes, but I'm not hearing a, yeah, maybe. You've always managed to keep it calm, man. It's impressive. <laughs> um, and then what will help uh, me remain in the conversation and work towards shared goals? Um, so again, these questions are about like what are our classrooms and how are we creating the space for each other? You can find that at the, um, the website for the National Association of Independent Schools. Just a way to start to get into that. If you're not asking these questions for yourselves um, or with your colleagues, then you're not doing a good job of really thinking about the culture of stuff. Um, and I'm going to pause on this, but I want us to really think about this now. Think about the school or the organization that you work for. Think about your particular institution. And think about the culture of that institution. How well is, is your institution doing at this um, very lovely Venn diagram of social belonging and safety, academic growth, access to resources and experiences, and emotional well-being? I shared that I spent a good chunk of my career at um, Assets, and I'm thinking about the culture that was there. And because Assets is a school that works with children who have um, neurodiversity, but plenty of potential, there's already this thing where we have to make sure that kids feel socially they belong and that they're safe. Oftentimes school has not worked for them. They come to Assets and they need to feel safe. They need to feel like it's okay that they learn differently. We all would think of learn differently, but some are better at jumping through the hoops, right? Academic growth was really important, even though it was a school for diverse learners. It was really about, we're going to meet you where you are, we're going to help you move forward. And we were very careful about that progress. Even if a student wasn't you know, at grade level or at the same level as other students, it wasn't about that. It was, we're going to meet you where you are and help you move forward. So growth was important. Um, access to resources and experiences was huge. We had an incredible set of programs and lots of resources, but certainly accommodations made it a lot better. But I'll say that the emotional well-being, as much as we tried to make sure that everybody was OK, Kids who are neurodiverse put up with a lot in their life. They have a lot of emotional challenges. There is comorbidity that comes with most of the learning differences and, and disabilities. And so um, in addition to being dyslexic, most kids had something else that was emotionally challenging surrounding that. They had anxiety because of that. Or they had depression, right? So there's a lot of that overlap that comes along with it. So we did our best to try to take care of that. But that's when I think about the culture of assets, we did a great job of most of these things, but it was something that we really had to keep striving for in terms of emotional well-being. So take a second right now and think about that for yourself. Think about your institution. Turn and talk a little bit with everybody that's near you. How's your school culture? How are you doing in, in all of these things?
know what kid, kid, the 40 kids at night? You know what kid is for kids? Yeah, well, I'm sure it's because I'm, you know, I'm going to be further down than I'm not from you because they'll make my life this thing. And did you see me here? You know, especially the 40, as being the 40 school that we have done. We are so focused on academics and we're so focused on experiences and just giving them everything for the new policy. But we don't see that we for kids like this. Well, we've had two, no, we had two students that were, um, emotional well-being can would go along with the social belonging. But sometimes I think it clicks within the students just based off their where they come from, their yeah. language and stuff. Because you have like your Japanese kids, your Korean kids, your um, German kids. Yeah. Oh. Like a lot, six thousand five hundred dollars for a garden. Like you know, I almost, I'm 
overlay done with a guy in a radio lake. I don't, I don't even know how like, to spend all this money. What do you teach? Gardening and uh, um, farming. Um, for high school? Uh, it's uh, K to K K A. A. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we can come to a pause soon. Yeah. You guys have a big program, like the school, the, the kids are... We do. And they're growing and uh, harvesting and uh, like also like cooking and... Uh, we, we don't have the cameras, but we should have our own. We got ready to wrap up and move forward. We're going to continue this, so you can hold on to that. Think about what you just heard and what some of the conversations were. Think about what is maybe your most, or the biggest challenge that you see in terms of the culture of your school or your classroom or your environment. Hold on to that for a second, right? Or maybe hold on to something that you heard from somebody that you were working with. I'm gonna skip over this one, but I wanna just point it out as a part of the resources. Um, the collaboration that I do is with a lot of them, Principal Learning Strategies, Jennifer D. Klein is the person who's that. But um, as we were doing this conversation, she wrote a book um, called The Landscape Model of Learning with Kapono Siati, who is one of our favorite longtime Hawaii educators and the executive director of What School Could Be. But these are really easy things that we can do to start to get into some strategies around elements for thinking about stuff. But I'm going to skip ahead to this because I want us to have a chance to actually move into this. We're not going to do the full empathy interviews now, but there are two ways that you can, we're going we're to do a little mini exercise on empathy interviews. You have a choice on this one. I do want you, in this case, to find someone that you haven't already talked to yet today, so talk to someone new a little bit. So go ahead and move into a space right now, find someone new to talk to, and then I'll give you the next instruction. Okay. And just one-on-one -on, -one on this one. This is just two people together. Find some space. Shift around. Talk to someone you haven't yet talked to this morning. There we are. We do have an even number. Hooray! Yes, please do introduce yourselves by name again. We can't remember that from a half an hour, hour ago. <laughs> introduce yourselves. Okay. So, for these, we're, again, we're not going to do a full um, empathy interview process, but I wanted to give you this opportunity, this resource is something that you can do. Um, empathy interviews are really important for helping us to understand other perspectives and making sure that we're not making assumptions about what everybody needs. If you're trying to think about profiles of a graduate and building new missions and visions for your strategies, but you're not doing empathy interviews, you're missing the voices of faculty and students, right? So empathy interviews, we have a whole thing on that and what school could be. We're just going to use this as like a way to think about our culture and what we maybe want to tackle for moving into some action for the last um, last half hour of stuff. So your choice right now is either to follow these questions and prompts and just sort of have a conversation where you're asking some questions about your life and as an educator. Um, and maybe you could choose which, which if you want to be asked this or if you want to go back around to the other conversation. Your second choice, if you would like to, is to continue that conversation you were just having around the culture of your school and just start to ask some questions about the empathy mapping. What are the thinkings and feelings that go along with whatever that cultural thing is? What are some of the things that we see? Environment, media. What do we hear people say around that? What do they say and do? Where are we getting some pain? Um, and there it's, it's, I don't know if you can see it, fears, frustrations, and challenges, or gain wants and needs, goals and success, right? So you can use this empathy kind of mapping for either the questions that are here, for the personal thing, if that's interesting to you, or you can talk about the culture of your school challenge that you were just talking about, okay? I am gonna do, we'll do three minutes and three minutes, right? So I'm gonna actually, so the, the goal is one person's gonna kind of ask, but maybe you can decide. So for instance, if Danielle doesn't feel like talking about her personal stuff, she can say, I'd rather talk about my school challenge up to you, which you prefer, right? And then, sorry, what's your name again? Shannon. Yeah, Shannon's gonna then ask her those questions. And then three minutes, I'll call time, and then switch chain, turns, okay? So it's not a back and forth, it's an interview kind of conversation. Does that make sense? Okay, raise your hand if you're gonna go first, if you're gonna be interviewed first. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 
All right, I'll let you do it then. Okay, a new market set go. Three minutes for the first interview. Uh,
to put systems in place to have the school run smoother. Um, and just, you know, get to work with the kids. Um, no, not here. Um, oh, I'm, I'm the vice principal there now, currently. So previously, I was like a second grade teacher, a fourth grade teacher, and then I went into administration. Um, and then so you, I got to see all the different roles, you know, being in the classroom yeah. and then outside of the classroom. And it was, it was really good to see a um, big picture, like how to make systemic changes for the school to run. And it was cool because I started there when I moved to Milani and then 11 years later, I'm now in administration there. So it's really, you know, it's awesome. Like, uh, growing. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, you start small, right? You have your own classroom and then you branch out because you learn now system-wide how do you yeah. affect the whole school. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So it, we ran about 700 students. So it's oh, wow. preschool to fifth grade. So we have a lot of students and it's great though. It's great. I love elementary. Is your school elementary or does it go all the way to high school? It's, it's to high school. Like so it's K to 12. Eight. Oh, K to 8. Yeah. Oh. And it's only eight to, uh, to like eight to. Oh, total. <laughs> so it's nice. Yeah, it's so nice. Yeah, it's yeah. Just, uh, it's just a big family. Yeah, well, yeah, when it's a smaller, yeah, because when I went to secondary at Wailua, um, very um, small, small area, uh, small amount of kids, about the same amount, but it was seven to twelve.
this is a great way to think about it. What do we want to see? What do we want to feel? What do we want to hear? When we envision an education that brings out the best in every student. So, if you have nothing else to think about, use this framework as your, something to think about. Okay? And again, all the slides are in, they're posted up in the, the, um, the listing for, on the app, but um, you're also welcome just to take snapshots or whatever makes sense. I can flop around in a second when we get into this. Well, we're going to do a little bit of work in the, um, the space. So I want to just take you on a mini tour of the Caring and Connected Community space. So when you're in the What School Could Be community, it looks like this. If you're in the main feed, which is the community feed, it's going to look really a lot like a social media space. You'll see this conversation with L.A. Washer coming up in a couple of weeks. I think I'm hosting that conversation. Um, great, great conversation. He's an incredible long-time educator. Different events that we have. Some TED speaking at Mace, and so that's happening. There are different events that are going on, so you see this posting. There are questions sometimes that get posted. So that's kind of what it looks like in the main space. I'm going to come in to Caring and Connected Communities again. So when you come into any of our playlists, the innovation playlists that you see on the left-hand side here, all of these are our main areas. And each one of them is going to start with an overview and what to expect. This is what it's all about. And there's going to be always at least one big video to kind of kick you off about what the whole space is about, right? On this first one, when it's the overview and what to expect, you're going to see how to navigate. You're going to see the different tracks that are available. And it can take you directly to them and then additional resources. So there's always more than just our own ideas. We've got um, other people connecting. What our promise is, what we think you'll get from it, and how to make the most of it, right? When you come back out and you get into any one of these small videos, um, they're all pretty short. Some of them are as short as three minutes. The longest, I think, um, of all of our videos is 24 minutes. So what I like about that in terms of the playlist of thinking about my education days and being in the classroom, and I call it lunchtime PD. Like, while I'm having my lunch in my classroom, I could be maybe looking at something that helps to foster my brain or shift my thinking. So I'm not just stuck in my own head. Um, but it's also great, we have these set up so that you could actually use them in terms of team meetings or faculty meetings. And some of these videos, I would say, are appropriate to have that conversation with your students, like show the future of work. What are they thinking and feeling about their future and about work? Stuff like that. So there are a lot of different resources. But within each one, you'll see the video. Um, and then there will be a, like, how to try it. So a set, a set of steps that goes with it. A maybe longer deep dive video into how to do it and bring it to life. And then questions. Right? So if I'm an administrator and i got faculty meetings, you know, every Wednesday for the entire school year, I might take one a month just to let my teachers explore, play, think, and everything's built in there. It takes a little bit of that pressure off for yourself. Um, but you can also do it with yourself, and you'll get more going deeper, different options um, to get in there. What's great about it, too, is that if you are the kind of person who likes to go sequentially and you're walking through this as though it's your own little curriculum, it'll actually hold your place. And so when you come in the next time, it'll be like, you're up next for advisory. That's the next video for you, and that's where you go. So it'll hold it for you. So it's pretty fun. Okay back in here so that we've got it. Um, what we're going to do is actually get into the space and start to use it a little bit. So if you haven't already downloaded the um, What School Could Be app and gotten there, I'm going to come back around to our QR code. I see not a lot of computers, which makes me happy, but also, since we're using a little bit of digital, if you don't have a phone or a computer, please sit next to somebody who's got one and is willing to share a video or whatever with you, okay? So I want everybody to go ahead and, oops, that's not the right, there it is. It was a different one on my screen. This is how you get into there, if you haven't already gotten into the What School Could Be community in space. And again, if you don't have a device, just find somebody willing to like share or sit next to you while you have this conversation. Does everybody have this one? Are you in the What School Could Be space already? I'll do that while you guys get started on things, but um, it should be, yeah, you shouldn't have to be approved, but I'll go in and make sure everybody's approved. It's a pretty easy, fast process that I can do um, once we get into the instructions. This QR code should have taken you directly in there, but if you went to the app store, then you would have to get approved. But if you do the QR code, you should be directly invited in, so options there. I'm seeing people are still looking, still getting QR codes, so I'll pause. Raise your hand if you've got the community and you're in that space. 
It'll probably work for what we need to do today because their videos are all there too. You can go to the website too, whatschoolcanfeed.org and the innovation playlist, Caring and Connected. Should have most of those there too. But cluster around, um, you gather up with a little group. It could be the group that you're already with or you can go find somebody else to sit with. I'd like for you guys to be in some conversation mode here. So gather up while I get to our actual action. We're going to do not 30 minutes of this. We're going to do just a short version of this because we've only got about 15 minutes of time left. But your goal is to um, explore a little bit into this playlist and start to just take a look at one. It says here to look at at least a few, but just take a look at one video with your partners in thinking today, right? Whether it's the people that you're with or someone new. Um, and then get into a little bit of a discussion about what is this. So there are three that we recommend, but you can choose a different one if you want to for the Caring and Connected community. But these are actual classroom behaviors and things that we can do in terms of making a culture that is inclusive and supportive. Okay, All right, so your goal is to work with other people, to explore one of those three or a different one, just one video, and then have a discussion about what you already do that's similar to that, or maybe you do exactly that, and how has it worked? What are other strategies that um, get the same outcome? Making sure that you've got this, and you don't have to actually write this on paper and share it, but hold it if you can. Maybe if you've got digital notes or handwritten notes, you can do that too. Um, I'm, I'm digging the low-tech vibe, so it's fine with me, whatever works for you. <laughs> um, we're not going to do a gallery walk either, so don't worry about having to share all of that, but I do want to have these conversations, okay? So the goal is to get with other people, watch at least one video, and have a discussion about it. Fair? Okay, on your mark, it's set, go. You guys already downloaded it? And I'm going to work on approvals. Requesting approval? You're Shannon Moss, right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Just making sure. <laughs> Who else is waiting for approval? What do you mean? Sure. So I'm answering all those questions. Conversation. Any any one of the caring and connected community videos, but I highly recommend these as like things to think about and actionable. Yep, it should be under that playlist. Yep.
from the front and be more side by side with our students just to listen, to ask, um, with genuine curiosity, like what they mean, what they think. And give yourself time to do that. Anytime that we provide the kids with time to talk with each other and figure something out, they are trying to develop their understanding. And they're using their Anyone is fine. And Whatever is interesting to you. Have, so that I can start from who they are. For me, in my experience, that was always something where I could gauge what the students were actually learning or, or catching on to was by the language that they used. As a teacher, it's really easy to assume, you know, that Enrique over here, he was distracted, he wasn't paying attention, he probably didn't get anything out of it. And you find that Our out, dream is that we save, like solving a problem, so I can have some mindfulness time because sometimes I'm so fired up that I just need to like have it quiet to go, okay, how do I really feel about this now? Why do I feel that way? How do I do that? It's really important that both parties can at it, feeling calm and ready to solve the problem. And so oftentimes they do like a body check. So for your own self as well as for the student, like how is your body feeling? Do you feel like you're at a space where you can actually
to a pause. Just pause real quickly. Um, and again, we're skipping over a lot of these pieces. You've got them as things to try and to do if you're going to get into these conversations for yourself. And if you need a thought partner, I'm always available and I really love it. It's my favorite thing to do. So send me an email. We can always um, connect and talk. But think about something tactical, something tangible that you could move forward with after having these conversations today. Maybe it's a simple are you okay question. Maybe it's, can we maybe have this conversation around listening to students with my team, my faculty, or my trusted friends and colleagues, my wife, my whoever I want to talk to about this, right? What's something that you could do? What is that actionable step that you could take? And again, I would encourage you to write it down, put it in notes in your phone, put it somewhere where you're going to hold it. That actionable step. Um, within the slideshow, I want to just point out a couple of resources that exist for you there. There's this curiosity and innovation template. It's actually just sort of a project thinking. If you're going to build something for yourself, it's there. It also gives you some questions to use to kind of use the playlist and start to think about how you might want to move forward. Um, again, welcome to just use this in any way, shape, form that makes sense to you. And then when it comes to connecting your concepts and when you're thinking about how you might take this step forward, we're not doing a big dream right now, but maybe, maybe you are. Um, think about how your personal and organizational values meld. Think about the community itself being connected and caring and imagine that. What does that look like? Feel free to lean on our theory of change practices and peak principles if that makes sense to you, but there are ways to bring all of this stuff together. But I would love it if I had at least two brave souls, although I'll take all 12 of you, saying a first step in cultivating a more caring and connected community as you head out the door today, your exit ticket for the day. Anybody want to share out what's something you're going to do? I always have my students do a quick little journal entry about their weekend or whatever, so I'm going to rephrase it now to what are you thinking. Or what are you thinking about after your weekend? Nice. Yeah. I love it. Yay. Good. Journal entry is nice. Some other actionable? Yes. I think I have an opportunity to collaborate with the school counselor on um, some ideas that we've been trying to Okay. Teacher feedback. Student feedback. Yeah. Yeah. At the interviews. Let me know how I can help. I love it. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else want to share it to the whole group? I'm going to ask you for the very brave thing of at least sharing it with somebody that you're sitting next to. Tell that person now. Take 10 seconds and say, I'm going to. What's your actionable step? The person next to you.